Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about should coders design, uh, which is gonna play off words on should designers code. Um, I kind of graduated with a degree in metallurgy, which is a science of how to melt metal, fascinating. Um, decided not to work on it in a, s a single day, uh, became a self-taught designer, and after that I became a software engineer. Um, but kind of through this path, I tried to carry the appreciation for design, and I found that having you know, retained those principles with me helped me to become a better software engineer and a better um, kind of team member. Uh, so today is my first attempt to actually formalize the principles that I found through intuition. And uh, I think those principles can be really useful uh, for everyone who works on software. Uh, so I mentioned the word design, and whenever we use you know, an overloaded term like design, it's better to kind of establish what do I mean by that. Um, so if you will Google for design courses, then probably 90% of results will come back with some sort of course on the tooling, how to use Photoshop, how to use you know, uh, some other tool. Uh, but I think we can all agree that knowing Xcode doesn't make us great software engineers. There is more to it. And what can be better you know, than to kick off your uh, talk with a Steve Jobs quote? Also, it looks insane and like, cool in Japanese. Um, so design is not what it looks like, it's, what, it's how it works. And this is, it is the how it works part that I would like to focus on. Um, so now when we can establish what design is in the context of this talk, I wanted to uh, go through some of the points why I think it is important. Um, the first one is to try to avoid the lack of context mistakes. And as engineers, we are really focused on beautiful software architecture, on maintainable code, and all those things are important. Uh, but this particular point is about uh, kind of lousy user experience that sometimes gets behind um, the coding. Uh, so imagine that you were tasked with building a wheel for a car, and you kind of did the job well. It works well, it looks pretty fine. Uh, but now imagine that this wheel has to also work in the dust, you know, in, in, in sand, and it has to work without being repaired for several months on Mars, right? So without having this knowledge in advance, it's really easy to design a wheel that kind of works, but it doesn't stand up to all the specs. Um, so oftentimes, without knowing the bigger picture, it is really easy to kind of uh, solve a problem that doesn't really solve you know, the actual task at hand. Um, another point is about independence, your independence as a software engineer. So one of the examples is that oftentimes we're being blocked uh, by some sort of design-related uh, uh, problems. For example, an asset is missing. And these days, it's extremely trivial to look up a tutorial on how to export assets from, Sla uh, from, uh, from Sketch or from Photoshop and cannot block yourself even if your designer forgets how to do that, uh, forget to do that. Um, the second point here is resolving undefined behavior. So another quite common scenario is that designers will not think through all the possible edge cases and as software engineers, we see them way more often. The internet is off and you have to load some sort of user-related uh, data. Uh, so wh what should you do in this scenario? Uh, the easiest uh, solution that comes to mind is that if you will uh, take a look at different apps that do the same thing, and you will try to think as a user, what would you want to happen in this scenario? So would you want you know, a, a, a button to retry to appear? Would you want some sort of playful error message to appear? Uh, maybe you would want to type your credentials again, or maybe you would want to crash and show the home screen, which is probably not the best idea. Um, so detaching yourself from uh, your code base and just thinking as a user, what would you want to happen, helps a lot to, uh, to find the right solution. It also helps you to kind of lose the fear of how hard it is gonna be to implement the solution. This part is, is something that you can figure out later. Um, also, it's super helpful to evangelize those points to your peers, to your peers in open source community or to your colleagues. 
Because once more people think the same way, uh, it helps a lot in code reviews. It helps a lot when people not just uh, tell you, oh, you're going to use a poor you know, software architecture here. But they tell you, oh, you probably missed an entire case. You, your, your solution is not you know, addressing all the user needs. Um, so that might be, uh, th 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 those kind of people might be really good people to work with. So let's talk about some concrete ways of you know, how to become better, a better contributor, a better team member. Um, first one, and, and the easiest one that you can start with, is contributing uh, you know, tech expertise. Uh, so imagine for a second that it is uh, 2008, and we are building the first ever application to find the best ramen near you. So your designer might come back with a screen that allows you to type in the address, and then you know, once you submit the address, it finds uh, best ramen places nearby. Um, but we can kind of already see that uh, there is a better solution that we can implement here. Um, we can actually use the location sensor that all our phones have, and we can skip the screen altogether. So by doing so, we can save, let's say, 15 seconds of user time, and also we can address you know, the most common use case. So uh, you, you might be thinking that this particular example is contrived and that's you know, application sensor, everyone knows about it, but think about it in the sense that you are probably aware of technologies that iPhone possesses you know, you, you know them the best. Your designer will not always know them. So it is up to you to step up and to say that there is a better solution. In this particular scenario, we can skip the entire screen of user interaction and get straight to the results. Um, so another point is that every single technology th these days is multifaceted, okay? So machine learning in this example has so many uh, applications that not every product manager designer will ever know all the all the um, aspects of it so it is up to you again to tell your designer we can use let's say machine learning in this example and machine learning as, as uh, you probably saw uh, in this example has uh, applications ranging from driving your car to translation to finding the routes etc cetera, etc cetera. so Designers and PMs might even know about a particular technology, but that they might not know all the extents of how the technology can be useful. And again, it's up to you to evangelize that and to kind of share your uh, knowledge. Um, another point is about contributing your perspective. Um, there is a great talk by Tony Fidel, and uh, Tony Fidel is a person who uh, who is behind designing uh, first. Uh, iPod and uh, he built Nest thermostats later on. Um, his talk goes about his uh, you know, thinking, his, his way of thinking when he designs products. And one of the core points that he makes in that talk is habituation. Uh, habituation is something that uh, kicks in when our brain is trying to offload complicated tasks. So for example, when you just started learning to drive, habituation helped you to relax over time and to going to pay less attention to the process of driving itself, but instead focus on more important tasks that you have to handle at the moment. Um, habituation also kicks in when we uh, deal with some sort of complicated or uncomfortable uh, work that we have to do often. And one of the examples is any sort of alert uh, view that you have to skip to get to your content. Uh, that's when you just start clicking whichever button you know, is, is, is uh, bigger or, or um, in this case, like any button really. So it will make you do something without even thinking about it. Uh, so habituation is something that uh, also makes us noticing problems with other apps way more than with our apps because we are dealing with our apps daily and we get used to thinking about how to get faster to the feature that we're building, how to skip all the inconvenient steps in between. And new users who just downloaded your app and started using it, they will be acutely aware of all the problems that they're facing. So it's really important to, to fight habitua habituation as, as an engineer, to, to, to try to stay um, aware of it as much as possible. And there are several ways of how to do that. Uh, the first one is to look broader. And to look broader, uh, in this example, uh, it's, it's about thermostats, uh, basically, when they just came out, came, came out, they were fairly simple. 
But over time, as utility bills went up, uh, the kind of manufacturers decided to provide people with functionality of programming thermostats. And not too many people outside of this room actually love programming. So it became this cumbersome task when people didn't really save any money until Nest uh, and other companies in the space came up with a solution that was based on machine learning and that was just learning from your habits what is the most comfortable temperature that you like. So in this example, looking broader is not just solving the problem of cumbersome interface, it's actually solving the entire class of problems behind it by providing people with, with a solution to their uh, original problem instead of uh, just providing a better user interface. Um, another thing is about looking closer. And if any of your phones has a uh, touch ID, then you can actually try it yourself. Uh, if you have several fingers enrolled into touch ID and you, for some reason, you want to re-register one of them, you don't have to remove all of them and you know, re-add them from scratch. If you want to remove one particular fingerprint, you just put your finger on the home button and you will see the relevant row being highlighted. And that will tell you that this is the row that corresponds to your fingerprint. And that will make it really easy to re-enroll one given uh, finger. So this kind of attention to details is what Apple is famous for. And it's this attention to details that's going to help you to uh, to help users in the moment of need. Um, lastly here, I wanted to call out uh, Think Younger. And Think Younger is this principle, if anyone has kids, they probably know how many questions kids usually ask, second. And uh, those questions, they're usually ridiculous in nature. And we sometimes we feel so overwhelmed that we tend to answer, this is just the way the world works. Uh, but oftentimes, I would encourage to actually think through the question, to try to answer it. Because those are the examples of something that is called retrofuturism, and that's how people imagine the future in the 70s, in the 80s. And most of those concepts, as ridiculous as, as they seem, they became reality these days. Self-driving cars, you know, a fridge that tells you that it's time to restock it because it ran out of certain products. Uh, to be able to talk to people through the distance you know, of, of across continents. All of those things became possible. And 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if someone would ask you, why don't cars just drive themselves? We would probably answer, that's just the way the world works. These days, it is a reality. Uh, so I would encourage to have a member on your team who thinks younger, because that will allow you to, to keep this perspective of, of an outsider. So why, why do I think that this is important? Why do I think that following these principles, trying to keep your eyes open to the problems that will annoy your first time users, why do I think that this is helpful? Um, there are three examples from Apple that I picked uh, that's going to illustrate what happens when you actually do that. First one is about uh, camera. So we all know that uh, according to Apple human interface guidelines, Apple says that whenever you record a user, whether it's a photo or video, uh, it's a good idea to play a sound. But naturally, you don't want the sound to be recorded in your video, right? So when you press a button and you start a video recording, uh, Apple actually plays the same sound in reverse. Okay, and this reverse sound cancels, cancels it out from the recorded video. So to be fair, this is something that this one person mentions on Twitter, and I tried it in iOS 11, you, you don't hear the sound at all, so there is no sound anymore. But it kind of illustrates the idea of there is an intent that user had, and there is an actual action that engineers took to kind of uh, help user with this uh, intent. Um, Another example is uh, about concept of active device. And there are two uh, illustrations of this. First one is notifications. Um, the simplest thing to do when user receives a notification would be to send it to all the devices that user has registered. But that's probably not what user would want to do. Because if, uh, let's say you just unlocked your phone, right? So that means that you interact with your phone the last. So this is probably where it makes sense to send a notification. And this is where your attention is at. So by sending notification to the, to the most recently active device, 
you actually get user's attention. And then if user didn't interact with it, you can send it to all other devices, hoping that user will read it later. Another example of this is Siri. And I know it, can, uh, it is a sketchy topic. When it works, the principle behind it is that you say, hey Siri, and you say, no, no devices has been triggered? Okay, so you say, hey Siri, and um, you kind of expect to, uh, device that should handle it should be the most capable device. So the way it works, and there is actually an article uh, by Apple, uh, you can find it down there, um, that goes into details, all the devices that you have in proximity, they start to listen to your request, and the most capable device will handle it. So if you will say, hey Siri, play uh, some sort of TV show, and you're at home in your living room and there is an Apple TV, that's the device that should, should handle it. So this is, again, this is the user's intent, and this is not just executing the code, right? Last example of this is uh, Face ID. Face ID, and again, it's, it's well documented by Apple. Uh, if you change your facial makeup or, or you have some sort of dramatic change to, to, to a face, um, Face ID might fail because it doesn't recognize you anymore. But if you type your passcode right after that, they will use the data that they just failed to recognize and incorporate it into learning. Because what you actually wanted, you wanted this data to be recognized as you, right? So if you had some sort of dramatic facial makeup and then you typed your passcode, next time you look at your phone, it will actually recognize you. Because Apple used this failure as a learning instead. So you will be able to unlock your phone as, as often as you change the facial makeup over there. Um, so to summarize, we kind of covered a uh, few topics here. Um, most importantly, design is not about drawing. You don't have to know how to draw or to use Photoshop to design. So design is mostly about how to think through the way things work. And I wanted to conclude with this somewhat cheesy quote by Apple because it's been used so many times. But essentially, it's about how beautiful software architecture is not enough. Drawing pretty pictures is not enough. You have to work together with your designer to collaborate, to create truly beautiful and stunning experiences. Thank you.